Hey everybody, welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. When Lucasfilm announced a Han Solo film five years ago, me and a lot of other fans were skeptical. We've never demanded to know about Han Solo's early days. In fact, it's kind of better if you don't know. He's the dark, mysterious rogue. And plus, you can't recast Han Solo. Harrison Ford is tied to the character like Salacious Crumb to Jabba the Hutt. Unless cloning, time travel, or better CGI became available, Solo was never the best idea for an anthology film. So what should they have done? Well, I've got a few suggestions for Lucasfilm based on a myriad of comic books, video games, novels, and just stuff I thought up while I was playing with my toys. Lord help me, what? Here are eight Star Wars spinoffs that fans actually want to see. Number eight, a Mandalorian political drama. Now I know, politics and Star Wars don't seem to mix, but stay with me on this. Mandalore is the home planet of Jango Fett and, by extension, his clone Boba. Thousands of years ago, the Mandalorians were ruled by warring clans who fought against the Jedi Order. So imagine hundreds of Boba Fetts charging into battle against hundreds of Jedi. Yes! Yes! <laughs> yeah. Years of war made Mandalore a ruined desert, and the people eventually overthrew the warriors and exiled them to the planet's moon. I'd like to see a movie about that transition where various clans band together to overthrow Mandalore's warrior cast. The logline? Mad Max meets House of Cards in space with laser guns and jetpacks. Number seven, an adaptation of the novel Bloodline. I was pretty confused by The Force Awakens. I didn't understand how we could go from this to this. The last day of the Republic. How did the New Republic allow the Empire to be rebuilt? How did all of these plucky 20-somethings screw it all up? Well, that question is partially answered in the novel Bloodline by Claudia Gray. The novel is set six years before The Force Awakens and follows Senator Leia trying to hold together an increasingly divided New Republic. The fledgling democracy is torn between two factions, the centrists, who want a strong galactic central government, and the populace, who are afraid of a centralized government. Something very familiar about all this. In the middle of all this, Leia uncovers a conspiracy where gangsters and deep government operatives are creating the First Order. During her investigation, she's also running for chancellor and she's outed as Darth Vader's daughter. Look, it's a great book. And it gives audiences a perfect setup for The Force Awakens. Unfortunately, due to Carrie Fisher's passing, we'll never see a live action adaptation. But fingers crossed for an animated version. In fact, if Solo was animated, it would have been easier to accept the premise. Number six, Tales from the Most Isley Cantina. This is a collection of short stories published in 1995 that fleshes out all of the background characters in Tatooine's favorite watering hole. Have you ever wondered how the jazz band got that gig? Or about the string of life failures that led Greedo to prove himself by confronting a trigger-happy smuggler? Imagine a Pulp Fiction-style film where various threads interconnect in surprising ways, and you could even include cameos from the original trilogy characters, and we'd get a more fleshed-out look at the grimiest corner of the galaxy. Besides, I want to know why Ponda Boba was in such a bad mood that day. Maybe his wife just left him for a guy who looks exactly like Luke Skywalker, and Dr. Evazon was consoling him at the bar. He doesn't like you. I'm sorry. I don't like you either. Here's my pitch. Snatch in space. Number five, how about a Rogue Squadron movie? Rogue Squadron is the group of crack X-Wing pilots who took down not one, but two Death Stars. Their leader is Wedge Antilles, and they're renowned as some of the best pilots in the galaxy. But I don't want to see Rogue Squadron's exploits during the Galactic Civil War. Show us what happened right after. Apart from a few novels and a handful of comics, we haven't seen much of the aftermath of the Battle of Endor, and a lot happened ABE. There were 10 novels in the X-Wing series. It's plenty of source material to draw from. Imagine that after Endor, Rogue Squadron is decimated and Wedge Antilles has to rebuild the group with the greatest hotshot pilots in the galaxy to retake Coruscant. And you know the logline. It's Top Gun in space. Number four, Star Wars Underworld. And this is actually a television series that Lucasfilm planned in the late 2000s. There are reportedly about 50 episodes already written and sitting beside the Song of the South in the Disney vault. The show was set in the underworld of Coruscant during the Emperor's rise to power. The project was shelved for budgetary reasons, but the concept is still strong. When Disney bought Lucasfilm, it was exciting to think about all the different directors who would be invited to play in the sandbox. Imagine what a director like Robert Rodriguez or Martin Scorsese could do with a Star Wars movie, especially a Star Wars gangster movie. And we constantly hear about smugglers, bounty hunters, and space pirates in Star Wars. There's endless possibilities here. Different criminal factions taking advantage of disorder following the Clone Wars, corrupt Imperials lining their own pockets, and maybe even a certain former Sith Lord can make a comeback. Spoilers for Solo. No! 
The big surprise at the end of Solo was that Darth Maul is alive and leading the criminal syndicate Crimson Dawn, despite getting a good having. I'm hailed! Were audiences confused when they saw that Darth Maul was alive? Well, if you've seen the Star Wars animated shows, then you know that Darth Maul was living in a trash dump with robot spider legs when his brother, Savage Opress, resurrected him with the Force Witches of Dathomir, and that he was later spurned by Palpatine, became head of a crime syndicate, failed to tempt a young Padawan named Ezra Bridger to the dark side, and finally died by Obi-Wan's hand on Tatooine. But if you don't watch the cartoons and read the comics, you might have thought, how did that feller survive a having? I'm cutting half pretty bad. An underworld movie could fill in the gaps for casual moviegoers, and could be our first Star Wars film that's rated R for violence and underage spice use. You wanna buy some death sticks? So here's my pitch, Godfather in space. Number three, the pre-pre-pre-prequel. Let's go back 4,000 years or so to the beginning of the Old Republic and the establishment of the Jedi Order. This time period has been covered in the video games Knights of the Old Republic and the comic book Tales of the Jedi, which featured a full-blown Jedi versus Sith war. But all of that material was invalidated as non-canon after Disney bought Lucasfilm, so we're starting with a clean slate. And one of the problems with the prequel is we already know how it ends. No one ever thought Anakin wouldn't fall to the dark side or that Mike Wazowski would become the best scarer. But if the prequel is set thousands of years in the past, we know everyone's going to die, just not how and when. Imagine that at this point, the Jedi aren't yet the guardians of the Republic. They're a sect of warrior monks who keep to themselves and don't think much of the fledgling galactic government. But a few Jedi start exploring a new aspect of the Force, a dark side, if you will, and break off to form the Sith Order. When the Sith attack the Republic, the Jedi enter a kind of reluctant partnership with the Galactic Senate. Imagine a pitched battle of Jedi versus Sith. The Republic nearly falls before it's even begun. And in the end, the Jedi think the Sith are destroyed. Spoiler alert, they're not. One survives and goes on to establish the rule of two. There's also a bit of obscure Star Wars canon that could be introduced in this film. The Jedi Temple on Coruscant was originally built on top of an ancient Sith shrine. The dark side of the Force slowly permeated the temple, which allowed Palpatine to mask his Sith nature from the Jedi. Logline, Game of Thrones in space. Hey, wait a minute. Yes! Yes! Number two, a Darth Vader solo film. Darth Vader's time between trilogies has been covered in novels and comics, but we deserve to see a young, fledgling Dark Lord on the big screen. Imagine a Darth Vader in the days after the Empire is formed. He's still heartbroken over Padme, struggling with the conflict within him, and filled with a burning hatred for Obi-Wan. He would travel across the galaxy, hunting down Jedi stragglers and having aggressive negotiations with planets that are reluctant to join the Empire. There is so much great source material to draw from. In the recent Darth Vader comic, he has to earn his lightsaber by first killing a surviving Jedi. In the 2015 series, he discovers the Emperor lied about Padme's death and he plots to overthrow him. Every Star Wars fan wants to see how Darth Vader went from this no! to this. No! Oh, best scene. Yes! And finally, number one, and you knew this had to be coming, the Obi-Wan solo film. Hello there. Fans have been asking for a standalone Obi-Wan film since Disney announced they were making spin-off movies. And unlike Han Solo, there's no need to recast the character. Ewan McGregor has said for years that he wants to return to the character. His young Obi-Wan is one of the bright spots of the prequel trilogy. You were my brother, Anakin! And that's probably the only thing Star Wars fans can agree on these days. Though an Obi-Wan movie hasn't been announced officially, there are rumors that Stephen Daldry is directing and it will begin filming in spring 2019 in Northern Ireland. So what would this movie be about? Well, there's a 20-year gap from the time the Jedi Master left Luke on the Lars' doorstep till Luke grew up to answer the call to adventure. That time has been filled in somewhat by comic books and the show Star Wars Rebels. But there's still a lot of story to tell. When Obi-Wan walks away from Anakin, he assumes that he's left him for dead. So at what point during his forced retirement did he hear that Vader was alive and killing Jedi? Did he leave to confront him, or did he leave to answer a Jedi distress signal? There's also a fun possibility for this film to cross over with the Darth Vader movie. Maybe while Obi-Wan is on a mission, he's near Vader but has to mask his presence. The two of them could be around the corner from each other but never meet. And then the two films could show the same event from different perspectives, similar to Clint Eastwood's Flags of Our Fathers and Letters from Iwo Jima. And that sounds nice, but it may not be true. TMZ leaked a possible synopsis where Obi-Wan brokers a truce between Tatooine moisture farmers and the Sand People. And you know what? I'd be cool with that too. The point of a Star Wars spinoff is to show the tiny stories that don't necessarily fit into the greater saga. Well, that's my list of eight Star Wars spinoffs that I want to see. What are yours? Lil Yoda, the Thrawn trilogy, 
the Max Rebo band versus Figger and Dan in the modal nodes in a battle of the bands? Let me know in the comments below. And if this is your first time visiting us, please be sure to like and subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Eric.